So hello and welcome everybody. We are going to discuss today a chapter from our book, Mysterious Realities. Now, giants have walked this planet for a very long time and they seem to be raised, I would say, wouldn't you say? I would say probably yeah. around 18, mid 1850s. There seems to be a huge censorship of all this history. And you had recent giants, but there has been a huge, enormous bones found around the world, all over the place. And we've had yeah. incredible stories of people discovering these beings. You also had the Kandahar giant, which is an unbelievable story. A Green Berets in Afghanistan mm -hmm. actually fighting with a giant. Mm -hmm. So there are some stories. And I am joined with my incredible brother again today. is this incredible man of knowledge who is going to tell us more about the giants and the history of the giants because there is a history to the giants and there is no doubt something within you know megalithic drawings and all sorts of different pictures and inscriptions and all sorts that describe this so yeah. i'm going to give it to stephen because stephen does such an excellent job of relaying this all to you and uh so stephen welcome tell us about the giants and the history that's been on this planet of these m amazing huge beings okay so we go back you know, to the antediluvian period, before the first great flood, the second great flood, we look at world mythology, we can then look at world folklore. Almost every tribal community or, or tribal grouping has some kind of story or stories concerning huge uh, looking, shall we say, humanoids that maybe range from 12 to 14 feet, 16 to 18 feet tall, many even larger than that. Some in some accounts, even as high as 80 to 90 feet in height and more. We're looking at... Is that recently? Would you well, say these, the, these, tall, the, the really tall being? No, I think what's interesting about the idea in world mythology and world folklore is that the, the further back you go into prehistory, so we, we can even go back to the upper Paleolithic, you know, these accounts of these really gargantuan... Uh, humanoids that were 80, 90 feet, maybe 100 to 110, 120, 130 feet in height, wow. seem to then become shorter and shorter in their stature yeah. the more we come back into more recent periods of history. The further we go back, and again, as I reiterate, going back to the antediluvian period before the first great flood and the second great flood. So we're looking at a period then in the upper Paleolithic, going back around sort of 4,500 BC, going through to maybe 4,300 BC. So a very long period of time into the ancient past. But then obviously you take a look at Greek mythology, you have the Titanomach here, uh, that's the War of the Vengeful Beings or the Vengers, and then you have the Gigantomach here, which is the Warfare or War of the Giants that took place, you know, and again, this was all against the 12 Olympians under Zeus Olympus, the father of the Greek deities who all dwelt in Mount Olympus, you know, in ancient Greece. So it's very interesting. You have, again, this conflict that went on symbolized archetypally and linguistically, you know, and in terms of stories or accounts that are seen in Greek mythology and also in Greek folklore. So conveniently between, wrapped up as a part of mythology, just like it's some sort of fantasy. As usual. But then, it's, then again, it's the situation of the advanced superhumans who've got access to the occult technology. Yeah. Zeus Olympus and his Thunderbolts. Was that a laser weapon? Again, that's speculation. Yeah. But then you look at all these different uh, giants and they, they have access to their own types of occult technology. Mm. They seem to have a very different relationship with the, the, the rudimentary basis, the atmospheric constituents of planet earth mm. so and you obviously you know in in greek mythology you have a gaia prototheos yeah. she was a a titaness so a female mm. vengeful being she's absolutely wow, she was yeah. huge described as absolutely vast you know so it's very interesting looking at all these ancient conceptual ideas concerning the giants of the antediluvian period of the upper paleolithic mm -hmm. and you know there's so many different tribal cultures that discuss them but then also you have to look obviously at the holy bible yeah. and the book of genesis so specifically in genesis 6 4 it states there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of god came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. 
So in that actual account of the book of Genesis, what we are actually given is that there was interbreeding that took place between female human beings or homo sapiens and some of these mutated huge giants. And this obviously created half-breeds or half-giants that we then have seen accounts again in world mythology and world folk, obviously not just in the, the Levant of Western Asia and the Middle East yeah. with the Israelites, you know, with all the other various uh, groups that existed there, including obviously the Phoenicians or the Canaanites and going even further back into history in the Fertile Crescent of the Arabian Peninsula with the Sumerians, then the Akkadians, the Babylonians and the Assyrians and all their accounts of these vastly built, highly statured, you know, humanoids or giants that constantly were in some kind of conflict with the human beings or inhabitants of those geographic locations. I mean, you had the Patagonian giants, but most recently, uh, you know, there's so many stories of these cultures around the world talking about giants. Yes. It cannot be ignored, and it seems to, it is ignored in the mainstream science and institutes. They don't talk about this. Yes. But one who was very famous, which was the American well, he was called a giant, Robert Wadlow. Yes. But he supposedly, I, you know, it was some sort of disease that yes. he actually had. It wasn't that he was an actual giant. It was That's actually right. a growth hormone, That's something right. going on, wasn't it? I mean, he was, what, 8 feet, 11 inches tall, so obviously yeah. just under I mean, 9 tall. feet in height. It was very, very tall. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, going back to that period of But it's American funny how history. they honed in on that particular story. First, we know that the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. has had a long-term objective of suppressing or deleting or erasing any knowledge concerning the white giants that were so prevalent on the North American continent, specifically in the United States of America. Catalina giants. But yeah, the actual, the Catal yeah, Santa Catalina, yeah. which is an island obviously off the coast of Southern California. Yeah. Many of the fishermen there, in, going back through to I think 1968, end of, end of 1968 onwards, yeah. have accounts of literally dredging up not just shoals of fish in their nets, but bones, femur bones and skulls, that have beings that were estimated to be anywhere from 12 to 14 feet high, some as high, high as 16 to 18 feet. We know that we have, we, we're, we're kind of looking at an interesting uh, problem here with Western science. Yeah. So either we need to accept that all of these human beings and all these tribal communities, all these tribal groupings, all their different stories and accounts from world mythology and world folklore are all just bogus, fantastical ideas that they've all dreamt up simultaneously, which is, at, the probability of that is, is off the Richter scale. There's no yeah. way that could take place. And that they're just having these, obviously, imaginative periods of time in their lives here on planet Earth, imagining these gargantuan, highly statured giants who in every, in every culture, or we have to accept that the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. is actively involved in the suppression and the erasing and deletion of all knowledge concerning these antediluvian white giants. You know, we, the amount of stories yeah. and accounts so Jay, of the Native American James Indians. Rickleton, you know, James Rickleton, the, the guy, the traveller back, yeah. I mean, what, 18, late 18th century, right? That's 18, right. 19, yeah. 1900s. And yeah. the Kandahar giants. Yeah. Do you think it links back to the Tartarian giants and the Hyperborean giants, all these giant races? Do you think it goes back that far? Or do you feel that... Yeah, all these were descendants from that race, or you know, or was it just that planet Earth had different humanoid type, hominoid type beings on it? We know that from studies that have been done, shall we say, this is uh, an alternative form of anthropology that at least four specific genotypes of giants have been established to have existed in the antediluvian period, mm. and actually, arguably, many of them probably existed in prevalent numbers even in the early medieval period. Mm. But the, the, in terms of large populations with the usage of advanced occult technology around planet Earth, it, they, they've had a very long-term history on this planet. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the case just that in uh, you know, Great Tataria in northern Russia you had these white giants or Tatarian giants, you know, perhaps whose genetic lineage did go back to the time of the Cyclopean giants also known as the Hyperborean giants that lived in the polar Urals and the northern Urals of north central Russia. Mm. But to many other regions of planet Earth, and many different giants perhaps had different skin tones, different ethnicities, as you get with human beings. But they weren't large humans, were they? They were actually a Pacific. They were distinctly 
genetically different yeah. to human beings. They had obviously similarities in their DNA mm. and obviously uh, their genetic encoding, but they were not, um, shall we say, hugely statured homo sapiens. There was yeah. no way they were. There is specific physiological differences that have been found mm. in the skeletons of the giants. Um, I think really things like the cranial structures of their skulls and certain aspects to do with their leg bones, their arm bones, their rib cages, certain subtle differences. I mean, these Ecuadorian giants, they were like over 25 feet high. That's right. I yes. mean, that was unbelievable. Yeah, so as we, as we know that the actual native Ecuadorians, for example, is you know, they have a very long-term history when it comes to the white giants of Latin America, specifically South America. Yeah. You know, so you have up in the Andean mountains, you have accounts of these white giants coming down from those remote areas into the Ecuadorian uh, jungle mm. and actually wow. being seen foraging for food, hunting, and, and then major battles or conflicts suddenly arising with these various Ecuadorian indigenous tribes. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, it's very interesting how a lot of this it hasn't been catalogued, hasn't been closely analysed by, shall we say, historians or anthropologists, because again, it's just, it's just viewed again as another aspect of world mythology or world folklore that's a load of rubbish. I mean, we can, you, you know, I, I, I know it's just a picture, but even when you look at the old maps, and Patagonian giants, there was actually a region in Patagonia, South America, that actually has large giants on the map, stating that this was a yeah. giant region. White giants that were maybe 10 to 12 feet high, yeah. they had no genetic relation to the indigenous South American Indians of that part of Argentina, and yet they had lived there knowingly for aeons of time, mm -hmm. and obviously when, shall we say, the explorers from the old world turned up from places like Western Europe, specifically obviously Portugal and Spain, yeah. and obviously England, um, there was many eyewitness accounts of these Patagonian giants or white giants of Argentina, mm. um, and they, many of them were killed, and many of the others perhaps retreated into more remote areas up into the Andean mountains. Yeah. Where they went from that is this pure speculation after that. You know? I mean, we can speculate and say there that obviously a safe refuge place to be in would have been inside the earth. That's right. So, you know, logically it would make sense if there was something happening or disruptions on the surface that people would go inside and hide Absolutely. from things. So yeah. it's not too far out when you logically look at this and actually think, well... You know, giants might actually retreat, and that this is where it opens up all the other ideas of subterranean worlds and it, possibly it, the hollow earth and all these different things. Does, so, yeah, very connected, absolutely. very connected. I think it creates a major problem when it comes to the highly suspect theory of evolution. You know, we're told that the the, the dinosaurs died out, you know, sixty four million years <sighs> yeah. BC. We're told all of this, and there's no way that you know hugely statured giants could ever exist, yeah. and that Homo sapiens somehow seemingly evolved from a, a you know a process of, a process of speciation. It's only ever been presented as a theory, not yeah. scientific fact so or just, scientific law. And people understand that it is a theory. Like these are yeah. you know like a lot of reality is still a theory. But of course, level, obviously there is real things, there's physicality of things. But a lot of this is mm. us still working this out, and that's what we need to understand, right? But it really edits out any idea that in the antediluvian period and the upper Paleolithic that all these white giants of North America, the white giants of, you know, Great Tatara, even ranging back thousands of years of time yeah. to when the Cyclopean giants or the Hyperborean giants existed in, in what today is known as Northern Russia and obviously the Arctic North Polar region, yeah. that none of this could be factual, cannot even be considered on any scientific level to be taken seriously. It's, it's this class is, you know, more stories, more fantastical concepts and ideas from the minds of so-called primitive tribal communities mm. with their different aspects of world mythology and world folklore. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's just not the case. You know, there's, so, there's too many accounts that are, in terms of comparative historical 
timelines, in terms of cultural perception, in, in terms of the correlation of very similar data yep. across different um, geographic locations, whether the North American continent, whether it's Latin America, the Asian continent, and so on, mm. where all these different indigenous tribal communities, most of them have never encountered each other in history, <laughs> knew nothing of each other, didn't speak each other's languages, and yet they're all coming up with very similar stories, even yeah, similar that's... racial descriptions of the pale-complexioned white giants, 12 yeah. to 14 feet tall, with bright red beards and bright red hair and bright blue eyes. Yeah. Well, that, you know, and they were seen by huge numbers of Native Americans all across the United States of America mm -hmm. and Canada, and obviously across northern Russia and many other locations. That's right, so the Sik Sikash yeah. giants, when... The, the story of that with the American Indians where they actually, which is recorded in history. The, the amount of conflicts that went on, you know, in uh, the history of the United States of America between different American Indian tribes and these white giants were legendary. Yeah. There were so many different battles and conflicts yeah. that went on for literally intermittently, obviously, over aeons of time. Yeah. You know, going back way back into the antediluvian period. But it's known that originally these white giants, who had, many of whom had lived up in the Appalachian Mountains, the Rocky Mountains, and the Cas Cascade Range, which is in Washington State, yeah. in the northwestern United States of today, mm. um, they had very advanced occult technology and lived in these shimmering metallic cities yeah. that were built high up in the Appalachian Mountains, the Rocky Mountains, and the Cascade Range, and so, so what, forth. what would have happened to them? The cities have been now, a... What? That, well, they would have fallen into disrepair. Archaeologists are not funded to go up into those uh, well, they're remote areas. they're quarantined out. They're not allowed, people aren't allowed to go inside, things like that. Well, this. we know, for example, in the Sierra Nevada mountain range, that there are huge uh, militarized zones there where ordinary American citizens have no legal remit to even get into. Mm. Now, they're completely, literally locked away from the public. There's nobody can go there. It makes me think the times that I've been to southern France, northern Spain, and you get the Pyrenees, because the Pyrenees, oh, yes. there is a huge amount of military activity That's there. That's right. And really, it's really remote. So what is going on there? Nobody knows. Like, there's yeah. no war zones or anything going on around there. Mm -hmm. So there is so much stuff. There's so much goes on. The same thing is going on, we know, for example, in, shall we say, southern Argentina and southern Chile, in yeah. Latin America. They're huge in the Andean highlands and the Andean mountains. Wow, yeah. Vast, thousands of square kilometers are fenced off with literally 20 foot high wow. uh, metal fencing. And, and these fences run on for hundreds of kilometers yeah. through uh, forested and wooded areas. And nobody has any access into these areas. And you wonder what is going on, yeah. what artifacts, what perhaps very profound archaeological remains have been found there. Have cities of these antediluvian giants been found mm. in the Andean mountains? Have they been found in the Pyrenees mountains? Uh, Norway as well. Oh, Travelling yeah. to Norway, like the so, you know, the history of giants to Norway is immense. Yeah, absolutely, and not too long ago, like mm. only two hundred years ago, there were huge giants sighted, and yeah. some very magical stories. The artworks of the eighteenth century. Yeah fascinating drawings of huge giants and yeah you could say it's someone's imagination but again imagination like Stephen said before imagination ideas facts theories they do come from somewhere of course this is all part of us you know it makes you wonder whether the actual dna and genetic encoding of the giants was uh, literally resonating on a different vibrational mm. level to that of human beings or homo sapiens yeah because like the cherokee little people of the united states of america yeah. who were also known to many other american indian tribes yeah. uh, you know and all the stories of fairies and elves from celtic folklore in ireland and scotland and wales yeah. and so on and so on and obviously the same across many countries like france and germany and western europe they seem to all resonate just beyond linear space-time and can blink into and out of this 3D holographic reality in the material dimension, yeah. literally with almost autonomic ability, as though it's a psychic willing process that takes place that they're fully conscious of and they know how to control at, you know, when they need to, and they can reappear when they want to, perhaps using geomagnetic ley lines as a form of transportation, mm. which has been posited by anthropologists who've encountered the Sasquatch or the Bigfoot right. in the United States of America and parts of Canada, right. who uh, they've had psychic contact with, there's been transcripts written down of information that's been psychically received, 
and they explain that they actually traverse beyond space and time by changing the molecular structures of their own corporeal bodies into being bioetheric and they can move wow. hundreds of kilometers instantaneously and reappear. Wow. So again, again, it's sheer speculation, but were some of these white giants in possession perhaps of some kind of occult technology or did they have very advanced psychic and telepathic abilities themselves that allowed them to do exactly the same as that? Incredible. So what, let's just finish up on a note of the Albion giants and mm. just a little discussion about that because a lot of people don't realise, but in... In England alone, oh, there's incredible. been a huge history of giants. Yes. And, you know, even possibly the stone circles, uh, right. some circles were built by giants. And obviously during the Roman Empire and when the Roman invasions, all this would have probably been yes. censored and deleted, yep. like so much other <laughs> things that happened. There's various accounts. But so, the, the giants, yeah, yeah discuss. Well, if you go back to the time of the Roman legions, you know, and obviously the time of Gaius Julius Caesar and yeah. the invasion of Britannia as it, or Albion in AD 54, we know that there were many stories, you know, from the Celtic Britons yeah. that then obviously were inherited, you know, by, um, shall we say, the English and became therefore part of English folklore of these giants that frequented many of the more remote locations in England, yeah. or as it was the time as Albion. Yeah. Uh, there's been many accounts where the Roman legions captured giants, not just in Britannia or Albion, uh, but also in other parts of, of, shall we say, the Western world, specifically in places we know today as France and yeah. Belgium and Holland and Germany. And they were transported into the Italian peninsula and were, you know, were showpieces that were um, literally paraded around. Unfortunately, many of them obviously were obviously killed eventually, um, but they were shown to the Roman citizens as conquered, you know, hugely statured, humanoid life forms that the Roman legions and therefore the Roman Empire had control over. It was a way of mm. really demonstrating their own prowess as being the dominant controlling, uh, shall we say, imposition yeah. over human freedom at the time. So Amazing. Well, there is no doubt giants exist somewhere. Somewhere, somehow, they have existed. There is, as we've just spoken about, these are some of the stories that are within our book and it's Mysterious Realities that is available on Amazon in paperback and ebook. You can also purchase on my website direct. The links are below. Thank you, my brother. That's okay. And it's a bye from me. And it's goodbye from me.